Good morning. Uh, good morning, church. Uh, before I begin my sermon this morning, I want to thank everyone who has reached out to us uh, via uh, phone calls, text messages, uh, emails. Uh, our family is doing well. We are still in quarantine. Uh, the kids, uh, Kristen and I, all tested negative uh, for COVID-19. We went to, into quarantine because Samira tested positive. Uh, she seems to be doing okay tomorrow. Um, uh, she's going to be coming out of quarantine. Uh, I honestly think she is living her best life. Unlimited tech time. Uh, room service where food is brought to her. And no annoying siblings around her. So uh, I don't know if she's ever going to leave her room or not. Uh, let us pray. God, we come before your presence with thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, our God and King. Amen. What is your identity? How do you define yourself? Uh, my uh, driver's license fell down here. Uh, so this is my driver's license. I kind of kind of defines who I am. It tells me that I'm 5'8". I have black eyes. I'm an organ donor. Uh, and I live in Aston, Pennsylvania. But there's more to it, more to what is written on this uh, little plastic uh, piece um, that, is, that defines myself. How do you introduce yourself? Is it based on your role? Do you say, I'm an engineer, I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher, I'm a social worker, I'm a doctor, I'm a banker? Or do you identify yourself based on your relationships? I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a husband, a wife, a sister. How do you do that? Or do you identify yourself based on your accomplishments? I have earned this. I have all this. Or is it based on your political affiliations? Or is it based on your hobbies? The question that I'm posing to you this morning is, uh, what happens when you no longer are an engineer? What happens to you when, you when there's a shift in the relationship as to how you describe yourself? How, what happens when you no longer follow a certain political party or participate in a certain hobby? What happens then? See, I see these shifts not only as individuals, but these shifts are happening for us as a community and a nation as well. So who are we, church? Who are we? The reality is the norm is no longer the norm. I cannot leave my house till January 22nd. Those who know me know to me know that I'm a busy body. I like to be all over the place. I like to meet with people and I like to go places. So what is my identity today? What is our church's identity? How do we introduce someone new to our church? How do we describe our church? This past Christmas season, I had an identity crisis of my own with regards to the church. It was like any other ones before. I told everyone, everyone who was on staff here, not to advertise our Christmas Eve worship services. On our Facebook page, Delco Times, on the sign that's outside here on Concord Road, I told everybody, I actually wrote emails, please do not advertise Christmas Eve worship services. And then I said these words, I don't want many people coming to our church on Christmas Eve. Seriously, I made those statements for the 5 p.m., uh, 5.30 p.m. service on Christmas Eve, we hit about 50 people who were registered, who checked in, and my blood pressure was going off the roof. And I vividly remember, remember praying, standing in this same sanctuary space as the worship service was about to start. My prayer went this way, God, please, please don't send any more people to our sanctuary. I, I think that was the first time I ever prayed in my life where I asked God not to send people to church on Christmas Eve. So what is our identity as a church? Who are we as Mount Hope Church? What is our thesis statement, our mission statement? 
Why is it that we exist? This is a question for us to wrestle with. And when we have difficult questions, we go to the scriptures. We turn to the scriptures. And I think Jesus answers this question very clearly and simply. And I want to put the story in context, what was read to us from Luke chapter 4. Uh, this Luke chapter 4 is the first public action of Jesus. Jesus, this is the first thing that Jesus does before he starts his public ministry. And Jesus, uh, so just to kind of catch you up so far as to where we are in this story, prior to in Luke chapter 3, we saw the baptism and the genealogy of Jesus. And when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice from heaven, God declaring, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. We hear those words. And then Jesus is taken away into the wilderness where he is tempted for three, he is tempted. There are three temptations that Jesus faces. And all these three temptations, Jesus conquers them by standing on the word of God. By the promises that were given in the Old Testament. So that is where we end chapter 3. And now we are into chapter 4 where Jesus is about to start his public ministry. Jesus is about to start his public ministry and he walks into the synagogue. One of the things that I want to make sure that you, that we are aware of, there is, has been a shift in how the Jewish people worship when the Old Testament ended and the New Testament opened. There, those years in between are called intertestamental periods. A lot of things happened in how Jewish people started to see God and view God and worship God. And one of the ways they started worshiping God is they started worshiping God in their synagogues. And the reason for that is because the Jewish people were dispersed all over the known world and the temple was destroyed. So they started a place called a synagogue where a bunch of them would gather together on, on the Sabbath and they worshipped God. And Jews to this day worship in the synagogue and actually a lot of what we do as a church. The reason I'm standing here and preaching this morning is because this tradition comes from the synagogue. This is what people in the synagogue did. And the church adopted these practices from the synagogue when the early church started. And to this day, we follow the same things that were happening in the synagogue. So Jesus walks into the synagogue and he pricks up the scroll and he reads from Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2 and Isaiah 58 6. And the scripture that he reads is simple, but I want to focus on what Jesus tells us after reading the scripture. This is what Jesus reads to those that show up on that day to worship God in the synagogue. Unfolding, unrolling it, he found a place where it was written. He's, now Luke is telling us that Jesus found Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus reads these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were focused on him. And he began saying, this is what I want to focus on. This statement. And this is what Jesus said. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus, after reading the scripture, notes, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, I believe that before Jesus started his ministry, he came up with a thesis statement. He came up with a mission statement. He stated his identity. His identity of what his ministry is going to look like. And I want to focus on three things here. Proclaim good news to the poor. Recovery to the sight. And set the oppressed free. See, this is what Jesus' life was all about. And he exactly did these three things. 
And later in the chapter, when you read chapter 4, um, later today, that uh, if you read at home, you'll see that Jesus healed many. But this morning, I want to focus emphatically on three things that Jesus said here. Proclaiming good news to the poor. Recovery to the sight. And set the oppressed free. Because I believe our thesis statement can be found in these words that Jesus is setting forth. Proclaim good news to the poor. Mike Slaughter, who leads a church in Ginghamsburg, Ohio, uh, he has, has been retired since he uh, was talking to us. And he said that if the church is not giving good news to the poor, then it is no longer a church. It is just a bunch of group of people gathering together, singing together, and hearing each other speak. We are called to give good news to the poor. You and I are committed as followers of Jesus Christ to give good news to the poor. Our Christian identity comes by caring for the poor. Please, please church, please commit to caring for the poor. Our church does an incredible job caring for the poor through our food pantry and our better life ministries. Yesterday, we gave um, a month's worth of groceries to 34 families. We blessed them with food, with pantry items. When there's food insecurity all around us, when there's food insecurity in our community, our church has stepped up to give to the poor. Friends, please care for those who are poor. This is one thing that Jesus does over and over again, that he cares for the poor. I want to challenge you to engage in ministries that care for the poor. Please give of your time and your money so that we can continue to give good news to the poor. The next thing that Jesus said that he's going to give recovery of sight to those who no longer can see the world. Jesus gives them sight so that they can see the world in a new way. This morning, I want to borrow the imagery that John Newton gives to us from his lyrics of Amazing Grace. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once blind, but now I see is what John Newton said when he wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. See, John Newton was blind. And did not see the world the way God sees the world. He thought that enslaving people was okay. He thought selling human beings so that they can be treated as slaves was just fine. He was blind to bigotry and racism that was, was carried in his heart. But Jesus opened his eyes. Jesus opened his, his eyes to see the world as something different. That every human being is created in the image of God. And that we are called to love everyone the same. This is what it means to give sight to the blind. One thing that I want to say this morning that is important for each one of us to hear. That Jesus did not condemn those who were blind. Saying, you are so blind to see the world. No, Jesus loved the blind. Jesus cared for them so that they would see the world in a new light. Friends, we are called to do the same as well. We are called towards working towards dismantling racism. Seeing the world as Christ sees it. Friends, this is important and crucial work as Christians. We as a church need to be committed to this work. Finally, Jesus tells those who are gathered that day that he has come to set the oppressed free. I love that Jesus has come into my life so that I can have life and life more abundantly. One of my seminary prof uh, professors described oppression this way. She said that if you think about life being held in your hand, oppression is something that pushes you down, that keeps pushing you down so that life is just squeezed out of it, so that you can no longer breathe. That is what oppression is. Squeezing life away from us. There are so many 
of us in our community that feel this way about life. They feel oppressed right now. They feel like they are not living the best life. That addictions and habits have taken over their life. They are not living the true life that can come from Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells us that he has come to give life and life more abundantly. And you and I are called to live that life of abundance as an example. So those who are struggling can see the life that we are living and say, I want that. I want that in my life. Friends, if you know someone where grief has overtaken their life, And grief has taken over their life and it is squeezing the life out of them because they just don't know how to handle the pain of losing a loved one. Please let them know that Mount Hope UMC is a place where grieving families and individuals can come together to process their loss of a loved one and find a way to move forward. We as a church are committed to giving life to those who are struggling with challenges. With those who are struggling with addictions, with alcohol addiction. We have created a place where those who are in recovery can come each week and call this home. This is what we are called to do as a church. This is who we are as a church. Our identity is about caring for the poor in our community. Giving them good news. It is about providing sight to the blind. Actively working towards dismantling racism. And finally, giving life to those whom life is being squished away. Friends, that is our identity as a church. I hope and pray that you would be a channel in living out these three things that Christ has shown us to do. Let us pray. Oh God of grace, we ask that you would give us strength, that you would give us courage, that you would give us the right words so that we can proclaim good news to the poor, with our time, with our resources, so that we can give sight to the blind by the way we live, by the way we talk. And God, we pray that you would give us the grace so that we can give life and life more abundantly to those who are struggling this day. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.